professor of English at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Dr. Kodrescu has a unique mastery of the written and spoken word. He has many volumes of poetry, essays, stories, and autobiographies to his name. His most recent book is available over there, I believe there's one left, and it is entitled Raised by Puppets Only to be Killed by Research. I think many of us can appreciate that title. <laughs> and it is a collection of national public radio commentaries. He is currently finishing work on a book about the recent events in Romania entitled The Hole in the Flag, and it will be released in May. He is a recipient of many awards and honors, including the prestigious Pushcart Prize, which he has won twice, once in 1980, and again in 1983. Dr. Kodrescu, however, is best known to us through his popular and topical essays, which are frequently fe featured on national public radios, All Things Considered. His essays are a favorite among the members of the committee and the world. And as I can attest, after sharing dinner with Mr. Kodrescu, he is as delightful as his essays. So please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Andre Kodrescu. I uh, almost wanted to change my speech once I got here because um, um, we had a very interesting um, uh, dinner with uh, conversations uh, going back and forth, uh, things about Poland and Romania that interest, uh, interested me intensely and certainly the Romanian situation is, uh, is one of the more mysterious uh, going on uh, in Eastern Europe right now and uh, I'm very tempted to um, uh, not speak of these literary matters which I brought before you, which are not quite that literary, actually. They're all political, disguised as literary in places. Um, but um, perhaps if uh, there is any room in there somehow, maybe uh, I'll both deviate from these, and uh, if you feel inclined to interrupt me, do that as well, or, or ask questions. Uh, it's also great being here because of the snow, because we don't have that in New Orleans. And I want to dedicate uh, these remarks and this evening in particular to my friend Hans Volker, a poet who died in California last night, a very dear friend. And um, oh, I don't know what that has to do with anything except that he's a poet and uh, he brought a lot of uh, pleasure to uh, his, uh, our little community there when I lived in California. And he was quite a remarkable writer and uh, thinker. And then he died. I mean, it's horrible when anybody dies, but when poets die, die I think, uh, I don't know, moves me more somehow. <laughs> One dear to me anyway. So anyway, the title of this, uh, of this talk tonight is What Eastern European Writers Are Going to Do for Us. And uh, it's a perverse title because us meaning who? I mean, us Americans, but I feel very American myself. So, uh, but I'm also Eastern European writer, so... Um, um, I could say what I is going to do for us, maybe there's another title, <laughs> or what us is going to do for I, you know. Uh, one of my thoughts is that Eastern European writers are going to bring us back the Mississippi River. Not only that, but they are going to bring the Mississippi River back. How, how are they going to do this? In order to explain this, I am going to begin with two buildings, two writers, two art forms, and two views of life. The buildings are the Museum von Brückenthal and the bookstore Kniga Ruskaya, both of them in Sibiu, Transylvania, Romania, which is my birth town. And the writers are Mark Twain and Joseph Stalin. The arts are painting and writing, and the two views of life are the tragic and the comic. The reason that Romanians have uh, two of everything is because if you're Romanian, you have two choices. You can be born in the city or in the country. Okay, if you're born in the city, fine. If you're born in the country, you have two possibilities. You can be the offspring of a peasant with a small acre of land, or you could be born to someone in a collective farm. If you're born to someone with land, fine. If you're the spawn of the collective farm, you have two possibilities. You can stay in the village and die of hunger, or you can join the army. If you die of hunger, fine. If you go into the army, you have two possibilities. You can get a desk job, or you can get to the front lines. Desk job, fine. In front, there are two possibilities. You, you can get shot in the leg or you can die. If you get shot in the leg, that's fine. If you die, there are two possibilities. You can get your own cross or you can get dumped in a common grave. If you get your own cross, fine. If you go 
into a common grave, there are two possibilities. So you can take the TV as it is, or you can take door number three, I mean. So. In Romania, people used to play two possibilities. They still do while waiting in line for everything, <laughs> uh, for bread or books. And so the object was to never run out of possibilities until you got what you wanted, until you got there. Um, there was never anything you wanted whatsoever. There is never anything you wanted. By the time you got there, you, 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 so you never run out of possibilities. <laughs> Uh, so another thing that Eastern European writers are going to teach us is tremendous optimism that flies in the face of every fact. <laughs> I said at the beginning that I was going to, to, to begin with two of those things I, I first mentioned, but uh, also in the true spirit of possibility, I'm going to speak of a few other things. Uh, I mean, very soon in this talk will sort of resum resemble its subject, which is the Mississippi River, you know, be a sort of talk flu, you know, some... Somebody asked me if I had enough words for tonight, I think. <laughs> One thing I may do is drown you in words. <laughs> and it is also entirely possible, since you are a, no doubt a, a savvy audience, that many of you have drowned already because you're very conscientious and kept up with every single Eastern European book and translation that was published in English between 1958 and 1989. And uh, even, even the strongest swimmer among you probably um, uh, could have gone down upon encountering something like the Yawning Heights. Has anyone ever read that book? It's a fabulous, it's a fabulous book. It's a 1,500-page allegory by a, a Soviet writer named Alexander Zinoviev about life under communism. And um, Zinoviev, of course, was parodied in the title, The Communist Cliché of the Golden Heights of Communism, which every essay ended with, The Golden Heights of Communism. She called them The Yawning Heights. Of course, on the other hand, in English, you don't name a book The Yawning Heights and make 1,500 pages and expect anybody to actually buy it. So. <laughs> the result of that could be sort of a drowning narcolepsy, which was actually the state of the Eastern European writer for the past 45 years with the exception of those occasions when he or she was purposefully kept up all night by electrical means or buckets of frozen water. No, so not At those times, the writers were very awake indeed. So. <laughs> but for the most part, we slept. I slept through my entire adolescence. Uh, whenever our eyes fell by mistake because we averted our gaze as much as we could on the front pages of Pravda or its clones, our, our Romanian clone was called Skintea, we were out like a light. You know? Just all you had to do is look at it and um, I don't know, I'm sure you've seen Pravda as well, but it was the newspaper. It has changed somewhat. Now it has pictures, but it used to be the newspaper with more words per square inch than the condensed uh, English Oxford Dictionary. It was just uh, dense. No advertising, no banter, no news. No news at all. <laughs> I really don't know what the post glasnos Pravda looks like. I haven't. But nobody can convince me that it can, it can be terribly different, you know, even if they report train disasters and nuclear accidents and so forth, you know. A pro style like that of Pravda isn't born in an instant, you know. <laughs> it took decades to turn language into cement. <laughs> so, I mean, a bit of news before the sort of monolith of prose that was forged by Soviet propaganda, you know, no, won't do it. And we're snoring. People are snoring at their desks. This is the case in my we're bent over assembly lines or public meetings in lines at grocery stores. The narcotic effect of Pravda as well as official speeches came from certain recurring words, product, productivity, the five-year plan, strides forward, progress, dialectical, scores of others. In various combinations, these words are pure morphia. So another thing that Eastern European writers can do for us who live in the electronically charged, forever awake global village is how to sleep. <laughs> At least something that, that's something that Eastern European writers were able to teach. Now that they are about to join the TV globe, they'll forget how to sleep. To get any sleep, they will have to reread their own works from those blissful days. <laughs> Nostalgia for sleep is already haunting the average individuals who miss their old boredom. That's uh, absolutely true. I have uh, um, proof of this, um, which I will later bring before you on the, on the part about television. <laughs> um, anyway, I couldn't wait to get out of there, so I felt when I did leave like a little word that was trying to escape from a page of Pravda. So I'll go next to another business which interests me a whole lot, which is the business of escape, which I find um, of burning urgency um, for various reasons. People ask me how I escaped, and I think escape is the art of our time. 
A few years ago, two Romanians escaped in a crawl space made by placing a fake ceiling over the real ceiling of a Vienna-bound train. They emerged five days later and were photographed proudly holding their fake ceiling for press photographers. Between them, they'd eaten a small wheel of cheese, a hunk of black bread, two onions, and a chicken wing. The two traveled folded around each other like Hippocratic snakes. One of the last escapes was made by the East German Heinz Braun, who drove across the border in a car with three Soviet officers. The Soviets were characteristically stiff and unfriendly to the German border guards, perhaps a bit more than usual since they were mannequins made by Herr Braun himself. <laughs> in Romania, people climbed into the smokestacks of ships bound for the west. They promptly died when the engines were fired. There was a slingshot tree on the Romanian-Yugoslav border. You climbed in it, and your friends pulled the tree to the ground, and they let it go, and it released to catapult you about a mile across the minefield into Yugoslavia. Sometimes people made it. If you made it, and some people did, you have something to teach Westerners, namely how to escape. It's harder to escape from the invisible, ubiquitous electronic prison of TV, but it can be done by carefully studying the literary works of good Eastern European writers, each one of which is a manual for escape. What's more, they were successful escapes. At first, people escaped by making dummies to take their places at work in restaurants in parks. There was a border guard in Bulgaria who came to work one day, saw himself sitting in his usual tower, and went back on to sleep. <laughs> Eventually, all those countries are going to escape. They will escape here, where we are, and are thus going to teach us another great lesson, the limits of our tolerance. Now, there are erotic newspapers, for instance, in Eastern Europe. Romania, when I went back there in January, uh, I discovered a great number of new papers. And, uh, um, 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 among them was an erotic newspaper called Serutul, The Kiss. It was printed on coarse paper made probably by the editor, and it had pictures of naked people that looked like blobs from outer space. You really <laughs> couldn't tell. Um, there were also bare breasts on Romanian television during the revolution. They were in a bad print of a Yugoslav beach movie without subtitles. The bare breasts followed gruesome images of women and children murdered by the secret police in Timisoara. And they were there for a reason. They were there to remind people who had seen the painting of liberty leading the masses that liberty has bare breasts. I'm getting to something very serious here, which is uh, very soon. This may seem frivolous. It is important to note this, too, because I think representation of naked people in art are under attack in the United States So while they're enjoying these uh, bad pictures. Uh, I think another thing that Eastern European writers can teach us is the heady feeling of overthrowing censorship while going directly to the, from narcolepsy to ultra-awake satirism. That's the why. Um, this business of television, which I'll keep going back to again and again, uh, has to do with the fact that the Romanian Revolution was, the Romanian Revolution, and I put revolution between quotation marks, was uh, very much a creature of television, was invented and, and created on television. Uh, the images that we saw were very carefully collaged to give us the pictures that uh, probably will be with us for a long time, because there is no such thing as deni uh, the denial of a, of a picture. Um, when we heard, um, uh, when we saw the uh, very famous uh, um, photograph of a woman and her child uh, killed with a single bullet uh, on our TV screens. Uh, it was an image that will never go away despite the fact that we now know that the woman died of alcoholism in a hospital and the child was from somewhere else and they were collaged together for the purposes of making this, this powerful thing. Um, I was there on, de on December 28, which was two days, um, uh, well, two days after the Ceausescu's were executed, and um, I went to the television station, and what seemed to me, because I wanted so much to believe that I was in the presence, uh, I was in a real revolution, what I did see was uh, what, what seemed to me a spontaneous, um, you know, continuous, spontaneous broadcasting of various, uh, of various things. and. Uh, uh, at that point, television had issued a call to the masses to come and tell their stories. And throngs of people were outside the television station waiting to get in and tell their stories, and it seemed as if almost everyone did. 
all they had to do is go into the past the first uh, be allowed in by the soldiers and go into a booth and speak to a producer and be let in to tell their stories. One of the most moving stories that I did here was by a peasant from Maramuresh who um, um, spoke very movingly about uh, the plight of his village and what happened to his people and ended his speech with a very unusual uh, plea for the government to um, increase the salaries of what he called our brothers, the miners, and um, to shorten their work week. Um, it seemed totally, I mean, it moved me uh, to tears at that point. Well, in, on June 15, six months later, well, immediately actually after the speech, the salaries of our brothers, the miners, were raised and the, short, the, the work week shortened, but uh, on June 15, when Iliescu needed uh, goons to beat up the students in University Square, who did he call on? Our brothers, the miners. Okay, since this may be uh, coincidental, but it threw everything under a certain, a certain shadow of suspicion for me. And uh, of course, uh, being there uh, both times, the first time experiencing nothing but euphoria and, 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 uh, and believing it, and then the second time feeling that everything had been a conspiracy and put together for various reasons. And very soon, after a week in, in Romania, I started to get this cast of mind, this paranoid cast of mind in which nothing was uh, incidental, everything uh, was somehow connected. Um, this is a... Um, um, uh, and of course, uh, the fact that uh, Romania being a special case, um, because so much of this was faked, uh, the secret police never went anywhere. They kept listening to everybody. And um, they listened to us in our hotel room. We picked up electronics in the wall. And, uh, um, but what were they listening for? Because everybody was talking. We were all talking about everything. And it wasn't as it, things were during Ceausescu's uh, era when we couldn't talk about things. And so they had things to listen for. And there are a few relatively select things that you could pick up, namely jokes, I think. What they would listen for was jokes. Um, I think for the past two decades, I mean, the only, the one subversive thing that couldn't be controlled by the vast police apparatus was the culture of jokes, at least in, in Romania. And the policemen listened not only in order to compile files, but to hear the new jokes, which they probably then passed on to their intimates, so there was never an interruption in the transmission of jokes. Uh, do you hear about the political joke contest? The first prize was 100 lei, and the second was 1,000 lei, and the first prize was 15 years. <laughs> Unlike uh, these other Eastern European countries, until the revolution of December 1989, in Romania, the joke was almost the only form of popular protest. A Romanian woman told, uh, um, someone <laughs> told a joke scholar, actually, uh, the Hungarians, uh, this was in November, the Hungarians make revolutions, the Poles, they make strikes, the Romanians, we make jokes. That wasn't as it turned out true, uh, happily. But everybody made jokes and eventually the Romanians uh, also um, did other things. And uh, in December, December was quite an unexpected, unexpected ending to nearly a, a half century of uh, grim jokes. And um, it's something worth talking about because one thinks of pre-communist Europe and finds little to laugh about. The Jews in I.B. Singer's novels, for instance, make jokes and they laugh in the face of misery and impending doom. And they love to make jokes, but life itself is no joking matter to them. But in Eastern Europe, by the mid-1960s, life had become a joke. And the quintessential form of truth-telling in almost all those countries had become the joke. So in addition to the joke's time-honored parabolic and satirical and pedagogical functions, it had an existential eschatological dimension that included everything. I mean, the joke had metamorphosed to become total. And the inhabitants of this, of this interior reflect, of the interior of this joke reflected it in, the, in myriads of ways. They laughed to death and others laughed and died watching them. Milan Kundera's novel, The Joke, um, follows the joke in one of its more familiar but least disguised guises and one with the most import to us, I think, in the West, another thing Eastern European writers teach us, which is simulation of the real. 
Everything in mid-60s Prague in his book is a simulation. Folkloric ensembles imitate folklore. Communist Party members imitate Western capitalist fashions. Young Czech kids imitate what they imagine to be young American kids. Imitation extends to emotional life, where everyone is caught in a world of a simulation of feelings. The lies have become so generalized that it is impossible to remember the truth. The truth, of course, has been re relativized by earlier imitations and is now without expression. For Kundera, the real and the real sounding are perfect, are complete and perfect opposites. But unlike some Westerners, he believes that a discerning or merely awake person is capable of telling the difference. Things which resemble each other superficially can be substituted for one another only as long as we sleep. Czechoslovakia as well as Romania slept for decades. And they slept the sleep of those who would rather not be awake, and they preferred their dreams to the lies that surrounded them. Public life was composed entirely of slogans, textbooks were filled with lies, television was boring, and the pages of the newspapers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, were sleeping pills. The front page of every book had Ceausescu's picture in it. Everybody woke up in February in Romania when school, which had been interrupted by the events in December, started again, and all the kids in the country simultaneously tore up the first page in the textbook. <laughs> It was a noise heard around the world. <laughs> the revolution is terrible, a friend told me in Sibiu, because we haven't slept a wink since it began. We watched television all night. <laughs> Everyone fell asleep promptly at 9 in the evening when Ceausescu appeared on television to talk for two hours about who knows what. <laughs> Nobody could remember. The Ceausescu's books filled the shelves of bookstores. Nobody read them. One of the most entertaining moments of the Romanian Revolution was when students threw all their books out of the windows of the party headquarters and off the shelves of bookstores. On television and at ceremonies, the Ceausescu's appeared surrounded by fake peasants playing fake folkloric music. The unreality of reality during this era will never again reappear. <clears throat> um, I remember, in fact, being in school and writing everything in a dream, sort of rushing automatically through my essays toward the, that inevitable phrase that ended all, all, the, all, the, all the discussion, which was the golden heights of communism. Um, another friend of mine in Romania, the wife of the man who bemoaned the peaceful television of yore, showed me her already bound and neatly typed doctoral dissertation on the revolution of 1848. Now tell me, pray, what am I going to do with this? I was supposed to defend it in February. Her dissertation began as it was proper with a quotation from Elena Ceausescu and was riddled throughout with quotation from the leader himself. <laughs> you could no more purge this sort of document than you could debug the Intercontinental Hotel in Bucharest. <laughs> Already some Romanian scholars are beginning to bemoan the de demise of the oral culture of the political joke. Writing in Luciaferul, Rodika Zafiu says that the oral joke is a completely different creature from its transcriptions now appearing in Romanian newspapers. She submits the two modalities to an analysis and concludes that the permission to transcribe means the end of an era because beginning at this point, orality will partake of the written and something of the artificiality and formality of written description will enter oral telling and vitiate it. Well, I agree with that, actually. An adversary culture works best with body language attached. Jokes without mime, pantomime, sidelong glances, mock terror, rolling of the eyes, etc., are only a minor form. Nevertheless, I think I'll take a chance, if only to point out here to you the history of Romanian communism, which can be told more efficiently in jokes than any other way. Is it true, a reporter asked Ceausescu, that your people are freezing from lack of heat? Yes, Ceausescu replies, but nobody died from that. Is it true, insists the reporter, that there is no food and everyone is starving? It is true, Ceausescu says, but nobody ever died from that. The astonished interviewer throws up his hands. Have you tried cyanide? <laughs> <laughs> Next to Ceausescu himself, his wife Elena was the most hated person in the country. It appears that at long last a citizen obtained a gun and tried to kill the dictator at a mass rally, but he missed. How could you possibly miss, asked the colonel in charge of torturing him. It was the crowd, the man says. They kept shoving me this and that way. Shoot him, shoot her. <laughs> this was possibly the last joke told about the Ceausescu family. It was as if even the jokes had run out of anything but the crude fantasy of revenge. The citizen assassin, who in November had been only a character in a joke, became only too real in December when he and his friends pumped a great number of bullets into the tyrant's bodies. But this this uh, deserves a little um, digression here. 
It turns out that another story that we did here during uh, those days, which is that uh, an execution squad formed of soldiers actually did the job. It now turns out that two men, in fact, killed the Ceausescu, two men who are very powerful in Romania today. One um, uh, named Voiculescu Voikan is a former oh, philosophy professor <laughs> and colonel of the secret police. Uh, and the other is uh, another, uh, an another man named Virgil Maguranu, who uh, is, among other things, an amateur astrologer and a very strange figure with a uh, long beard, uh, Rasputin-like, who's seen flashing in and out of the corridors of the parliament. Um, the reason why we never actually saw the videotape of the execution, which was explained then as the cameraman in the moment having run out of film, is because they were not killed then by uh, a squad immediately after the mock trial, but by these two people. At 6 a.m. in Romania, the radio stations used to begin the program so that our leader is getting up, so should you. At 6.30, <laughs> 6 there was a second announcement. Our leader is doing his calisthenics. You should, too. <laughs> at 7 a.m., there was a third announcement. Our leader is now having breakfast. Wish him bon appétit. <laughs> When I went to Romania in December, shortly after the revolution, I found my old aunt and uncle, who um, I, I didn't even know they were still alive. They were shivering miserably in a cold little apartment in Alba Iulia, and they hadn't had any heat in years. It was really a wonder that they were not dead. I mean, they just I don't know how they kept, they kept warm. What is the difference between Hitler and Ceausescu? Asked another joke. Hitler turned on the gas. <laughs> um, also known, known now to us, a story that's still developing and is still mysterious was uh, the terrible orphan, orphan story. There are 130,000 abandoned children in Romania. Many of them have AIDS. And uh, they are the direct result of Ceausescu's draconian birth policies, which demanded five children from every family. Um, abortions were outlawed, and women were regularly checked to their places of work to ensure that they were not having illegal abortions. And that this policy created uh, artificial baby boom in the 70s, which then resulted both in this great number of children in the orphanages and um, in, the, in the students and the young people who went out in the streets and in fact, in fact toppled the regime. So there was a, a further irony to that. It was precisely this generation that went into the streets and uh, um, deposed Ceausescu. On the train to Bucharest on December 28, 1989, a woman told me, these foreign reporters came to our kids' school at Christmas and asked them, what do you want for Christmas? One by one, all the children except one said, our mother is Elena Ceausescu and our father is Nicolae Ceausescu and they give us everything. We don't want anything. But there was this one ranty kid in the corner crying. What do you want for Christmas? They asked him. My mother is Elena Ceausescu and my father is Nicolae Ceausescu and I want to be an orphan. <laughs> and he got his wish. Um, on Christmas Day. Well, and the last joke I did here in Romania, and this is a new joke, this is definitely post-Christmas. post, um, post uh, Christmas. In hell, the devil got the big iron pot boiling and ready for the Ceausescu. But Elena kept screaming and making it impossible for the devils to stick her in. I can't boil in anything but a gold cauldron, she said. I know you had to be there. <laughs> uh, by there, I mean the Ceausescu Palace in Bucharest, which was... Uh, rather extravagant and uh, had gold faucets and toilet bathtubs and uh... anyway but to go back to the beginning now of my story and uh, um, I assure you I'm rambling only a little bit I want to talk a little bit about the two buildings that I, I promised I would tell you about the Museum von Brukenthal and Kniga Ruskaya bookstore um, Baron von Brukenthal was governor of Transylvania in the 18th century. Uh, he was the lover of Maria Theresa, the Austrian empress, who gave him half the Vienna gallery for presents, including quite a few very good Flemish paintings. And the art-loving Baron was also the inventor of the rack, a torture device he invented especially, the, that is the torture rack, not the clothes rack. <laughs> Uh, a, a device he invented especially for Horia, the leader of a peasant rebellion. He also improved the Iron Maiden and was fond of public dismemberments and hangings in the square in front of his house. 
Two centuries earlier, Vlad the Impaler had, had held impalings in the same square. And only a year before, now I should say a year and a half, Nicu Ceausescu, the princeling heir to the communist throne of Romania, who made Sibiu his very own personal fiefdom, uh, was torturing political prisoners in the basement of the secret police building facing the same square. And he too was fond of fancy devices such as a thing called the Mobra motorcycle, which was a device for stretching a prisoner and tearing off selected parts of the body. Museum von Brückenthal is where my girlfriend Marinella and I went to make love because there was never anyone in there. The best rooms were, they, well, the best rooms were where they kept so-called socialist realist art. There were big paintings of healthy young workers and best of all, a full-scale bronze Lenin arriving at the Finland station on top of a bronze locomotive. Behind this mammoth sculpture was dark, and that is where Marinella and I discovered the future. I saw the bronze wrinkles on Lenin's neck contracting and expanding. <laughs> so, another thing Eastern European writers teach us is that the backside of cam communist statues can be as educational as the back seats of cars, <laughs> thereby equating Lenin with Henry Ford. <laughs> the business about the torture actually is uh, is, is is more um, uh, juxtaposed actually to the to the scene of our young uh, young liberation there. Um, uh, is is um, is more elaborate in the in the in the book that I've written because uh, some of the discoveries of. Uh, of the methods that uh, the secret police used in Sibiu were extraordinarily inventive and terribly cruel. And a reporter from the New York Times uh, in, in December asked me, David Binder, who's actually a very well-read man, and he's read <laughs> Romanian literature, among other things, he asked me if there is a cruel streak in Romanians. And I didn't think that actually there was, although there's so much uh, inventiveness in that area, I would point that way. My theory was that um, actually, you know, despite this sort of business, um, what there was was an inventiveness that had to do with bodies after they were dead. Dracula impaled his victims after they were killed. And so it was an inventiveness that had to do with projecting a, a much greater sense of terror than, than actually they were capable of, which is a defense of small peoples against, you know, larger history all around them. Um, but <laughs> I heard other stories too. Uh, the bookstore, Kniga Ruskaya, is where I used to go in the summer when I was a kid because it was cold inside and absolutely nobody ever went there. Red Army marches blurred from the turntables and the clerks regarded me suspiciously. They sensed something funny. They thought I'd come to steal cold air, which I later found out was air conditioning, an unknown technology to most Romanians. Lined up against the wall were the complete red-bound editions of the works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and Gheorghe Odej. This is where party officials, upon promotion, bought the sets that adorned their unread office walls. But in addition to these giants of communism, the bookstore also had the complete leather-bound works of Mark Twain. Now, here was a perfectly intriguing paradox to my adolescent mind. This was the place where the official light of communism was stored, yet nobody ever came near it. The existence of an official dream world right alongside the one we lived in most of the time, but which existed only in the shadow of whispers made for a dizzying paradox. The only thing that made sense to me was the cold. I suspect that it takes great reserves of cold to maintain an official reality. I found the same thing in churches when I started uh, frequenting those in some kind of adolescent search. But Mark Twain was and probably is my favorite writer. I believe that I read everything he wrote then, including his letters from Earth, which are hard to find in English. Twain was immensely popular everywhere in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s. This had something to do, I believe, with the fact that his brand of unsparing humor provided us with a weapon to resist the humorless creepiness of life all around us with its endless privations and censorships. For myself and for my adolescent imagination, Twain provided the fuel of an exuberant fantasy. My very favorite book was A Yankee at King Arthur's Court, which held out the hope that through a simple conk on the head, we too might wake up in a world different from the one we lived in, a world where we might exercise some control over our own lives. Interestingly enough, Twain's Yankee is a cautionary tale about a man who ends up exercising too much control, and that clued me into that possibility as well. In Romania, for the past quarter of a century, a single family controlled everything. But there is one other aspect of Twain's influence that was carried by every single one of my imaginative contemporaries, and that is the picture he gave us of the Mississippi River. 
I imagined this mighty river long before I actually laid eyes on it. The Mississippi runs through the creative imaginations of Eastern European and Soviet writers via Twain, so that one thing that Eastern European and Soviet writers might bring us back is the unspoiled picture of the Mississippi River, the way it was before all the polluting industry poisoned it. Twain's romantic river is a different creature now when other writers have called it Cloca Maxima, or the central sewer. So we may be witnessing an ecology of the mind here, a purification by literary means, a kind of exorcism. There has already been quite a bit of talk in Europe about the fact that the grand idea of Europe, between quotation marks, had pretty much disappeared in the West, but was kept intact in the East, where the normal flow of things had been brutally interrupted by Leninist, Stalinist ideology. Wouldn't it be curious if both an unspoiled imaginary Mississippi and an imaginary Europe were to emerge simultaneously from the ruins of communism? Well, yes and no. This business of Eastern Europe's frozen development preserving the spores of European culture is a little more than suspect for a number of reasons. The environmental degradation in those countries is worse than it is in the West, even though their slower industrial development kept them from industrializing everything. I imagine some of the talks you've touched on that business. Uh, and the idea of Europe that Eastern Europeans might have preserved in, is pre-war Europe, that cauldron of hellish nationalisms and overblown rhetorics. And that we really do not need. But on the other hand, what the poets and artists of those countries will bring us is a naive belief in freedom of speech the way we should, but don't practice it. They should bring us a renewed respect for freedom of speech and a passionate hatred of censorship. Since coming to America in 1966, I have followed both the writings of exiles such as myself and the work of freedom-loving Americans who have not been afraid of taking political stands on issues. Exiled writers share with politically active American writers the belief that the writer must be engaged in the world he or she lives in, that it is not enough to scribble obscurely. When I first came to this country, there was a flourishing community of writers and uh, artists who experimented with new forms as well as their own lives. They were out of the academic mainstream, but clearly in the mainstream of an American radical tradi tradition that stretches from Walt Whitman through Mark Twain to Allen Ginsberg and many younger writers. These are writers who took it for granted that America was big, that what was needed was a total push into the living vibrancy of American life, that one's job as a poet was to be central to the culture one both inhabited and helped to invent. The various anti-establishment strains of American writing in the past three decades, from the beat poets to the so-called language school writers, constitute the genuine poetic culture of America. But something started happening to American writers in the 1970s, a creeping disease of irrelevance and obsolescence, aided in large measure by the return of a literary establishment everyone thought had died in 1960. Bit by bit, the appearance of the professor poets, the proliferation of MFA programs in universities, the various journals surviving solely on NEA life supports, the acrimonious debates on the relevancy of creative writing and the ascendance of critical theory over the activist imagination began to take back the areas opened by the wide-ranging children of Whitman and Kerouac. At a certain point, American writing, particularly poetry, retreated into a literary ghetto inhabited by fearful career-minded opportunists who wrote books not to be read but to end up as lines in a resume. Literary movements were replaced by resume-building subgroups. <laughs> American life itself began to suffer from a dangerous narcolepsy that needed the awake eyes of passionate writers more than ever. While Ronald Reagan literally hypnotized the country with his presidential performance, our literature went to sleep along with everybody else. Is it any wonder then that someone like Jesse Helms, who doesn't know his Rembrandt from his Velvet Elvis, can... <laughs> <laughs> can stride freely among the snoring literati posting posting signs telling us what we can and cannot do. Can you imagine Jesse introducing restrictive language into the funding of art 15 years ago? He would have been told in no uncertain terms where to go by a violent storm of public opinion. He would have been rightly accused of being a new Joe McCarthy and he would have been burnt in effigy by the Jefferson Monument. For Eastern European writers working under the shadows of censorship, being central to their cultures was a given. We had no choice but to be political. Our slightest works were read and scrutinized for nuances and innuendo we didn't even know was there. It was quite flattering. <laughs> Not so flattering was the possibility that we might go to jail for it. But the knowledge that we might gave us a certain thrill as well as a sense of responsibility. In Romania in the mid-60s, censorship was of the, quote, soft variety, as Aksionov called it. One no longer went to prison for four lines of verse, as Mandelstam did under Stalin, but one could be enjoined from publishing, and life could be made more unpleasant than it already was in a myriad little ways. 
Toward the end of the 70s, the communist bureaucracies began to prefer, to prefer banishment into exile to other forms of punishment because writers were too dangerous if they remained in the country. The wave of writers exiled from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe had an enormous impact on American and in general Western literature. Here were poets and novelists who did not despair of the self-referentiality of language, who did not worry unduly about the end of art or writing, who, that, who did not feel themselves to be post-anything with a post modern or post-mortem. <laughs> they wrote as if the world still mattered, as if the world was still real, and as if it still had people in it worth paying careful attention to. The books of Solzhenitsyn, Vasily Aksyonov, Milan Kundera, Paul Goma, and Vaclav Havel brought forcefully home the idea that writing matters, that it is indeed intrinsic to our survival as human beings. In the technological societies of the West, writers have been marginalized just as all human beings have by the extraordinary power of the electronic media. Happily unaware of this phenomenon, Eastern European writers did not feel intimidated. Exiled writers came to the West in all flavors. Instructive in this regard is the difference between Vaclav Havel and Milan Kundera. Havel, the president of Czechoslovakia, was a courageous dissident who went to prison many times in defense of his beliefs. He is a rather sober-minded, moral man in the mold of Tolstoy, Gandhi, or Martin Luther King. His letters from prison to his wife, Olga, are exemplary of a mind concerned with justice which believes in bettering the world. At the same time, he is a man of his generation who likes John Lennon and what he calls the ideals of the 60s. John Lennon's death, he tells Olga, moves him, moved him more than the death of John Kennedy. Milan Kundera, on the other hand, another Czech writer, is an ironist, a humorist, and a skeptic. One cannot imagine Kundera becoming the president of anything, not even of a literary society. His subtlety would not allow him. He would quickly debunk his own importance, find himself embarrassed by presumption, and overthrow himself. <laughs> Kundera is undoubtedly a much greater writer than Havel, but Havel is undoubtedly a much better, better public person. Havel and Kundera are both men of the 60s who believe in creative solutions. The black and white world of great power confrontations is dead. Both Havel and Kundera are national heroes in their countries and they both matter. Their differences couldn't be greater, but they are both central to their and our culture. Um, but what happened, you know, to go back to Romania for a minute, what happened immediately after the revolution is that all of a sudden all these books could be read and everything that was unavailable before could be, could be seen. And um, in discussions with people there, I said, what happens to our writers now who had created an entire language to speak uh, of our world and the language that, uh, as I said before, mattered to everyone? They said, well, our literature is now going to get worse because we are going to have to speak directly of, of certain things. And yet, when I was there, speech was exploding everywhere. And the euphoria of the revolution had really unlocked people's tongues. Everyone was filled with anecdotes and stories, and there was a great proliferation of print and discussion everywhere that, in fact, reminded me very much of the mid-1960s in New York, when, likewise, uh, uh, I experienced the period of great improvised literature, and I could be handed a whole uh, number of pamphlets and paper on the street corner uh, to take home, a, a full book, uh, possibly Mimeo magazines, a whole culture that was instantly made, and something similar is happening in Romania and probably in, in, in the other Eastern European countries as well, a kind of uh, explosion of the word, and uh, yet it's one that is undoing, um, um, it's undoing the, the, the highly literary and, and intelligently uh, uh, and uh, at times profound language that was devised under, under bad conditions, under censorship. Um, when people spoke of freedom, especially writers, uh, they, they envisioned the kind of uh, younger writers, a kind of instant Jeffersonian democracy that was uh, moving on a revolving stage with uh, strobe lights around it. Uh, in other words, they had no, absolutely no idea of our reality at all. And so what they had in mind was an imaginary America that was gleaned from books and movies and illegally uh, smuggled music, and an America through which flowed Mark Twain's forever shiny Mississippi. And... Um, um, so what I'm, I'm telling you is that the end, of, the end of the literature of the exiles who matter to us uh, has come to those countries and what is going on there is a reinvention um, of language and liberty which may not necessarily and probably won't mean a greater literature. And, um, 
Uh, further irony, and the last one that I'm going to leave hanging in the air here, is that uh, uh, in this country, art appears to be the new enemy just as it is being freed in Eastern Europe. And uh, returning to my original question about what these artists and writers are going to bring us, I think that one of the things, and most seriously so, is a renewed sense of enthusiasm uh, for social justice and a keen pleasure in liberty. And uh, of course, there are other scenarios and not, you know, not so optimistic, and I think that's going to happen as well, which is an invasion of trash culture, of the tab tabloid and, and, and TV culture and sex magazines and exploitation films and all the kind of junk food of the mind that we're quite used to ignoring if we can. Uh, but uh, uh, serious Eastern European writers will begin, like serious American writers, to, to doubt their role in a society that's flooded by all this business. And um, finally, these are very curious times, and uh, I'll end with an, uh, with an anecdote. Uh, Alan Ginsburg.